Hello and welcome to the Nomen live stream. Uh, tonight we have a really great event, uh, leveling up UI UX in game production. Um, our guest tonight is speaker Stefan Dubé, principal UX and UI designer. Stefan is a technology and design expert with more than 25 years of experience in software technology development and video game design. He has designed interfaces for AAA, VR, AR, console titles, and mobile applications, and is known for his focus on user experience, efficiency, and efficiency. Currently, he serves as the principal uh, UX UI designer at Aravant, a Web3 uh, developer specializing in immersive games and innovative technology. Um, and without further ado, oh wait, actually, one thing I almost forgot, <laughs> we need to uh, thank our sponsors, uh, Lenovo and NVIDIA for sponsors sponsoring tonight's event. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it along to Stefan to take it away. Cool, thank you Anton for the nice introduction. I appreciate thank it. <laughs> um, um, thank you everyone to uh, come to my talk. And uh, so as Anton mentioned, um, Today's talk is going to be about UX and UI in game dev. Uh, my name is Stefan Dubé. So, um, so who, who am I? So uh, I'll talk a little bit about myself. And um, so I'm originally from Ottawa, Canada. And in 1995, I studied in graphic design at uh, La Cité Collégiale. And uh, as you probably noticed that I'm French Canadian. Um, but uh, in 1997, I studied in 3D animation at the NAD Center in Montreal. And um, so, and right now I, res I do live in Los Angeles with my husband and our dog, Betty. And I've uh, been here for uh, several years now and uh, really enjoy it. So um, as Anton mentioned as well, I have over 25 years of experience. I actually started uh, in the field as a graphic designer then soon after that, I actually moved into 3D animation. I also worked in tech support. Um, I'm also a visual artist. Um, so I also do UX, UI, and motion. I also create fonts, and I'm a teacher and a mentor. So some of the studios that I worked for, I started my career working for Softimage XSI. Um, some of you may know who, what Softimage was, but back in the early 2000s, um, Softimage was a pretty, um, it was a great 3D software. And uh, when XSI came about, I was actually hired to do technical support for XSI. Soon after that, I actually moved to working at Autodesk, where I was doing tech support for 3ds Max, Combustion, Cleaner, and Toxic. And um, after doing all this technical support um, for a while in my early days in my career, I actually ended up actually working at Ubisoft. And um, from there, I basically, from Ubisoft, I worked at studios like Wargaming, uh, Sony Online, um, and I also worked at Activision. In the last seven years or eight years of my career, I've actually been working in VR, and that led me to some studios like Servios and Ready at Dawn. And now I'm back making console games, uh, working at Airvent as a principal UX and UI designer. So I like to get into how I got into UX and UI because I feel like a lot of my peers, uh, we all got into this field uh, by pure accident. So for me, my story is, is that I was actually working at Ubisoft Montreal and I was actually um, a 3D artist. I was actually a prop artist. And um, basically what happened is that my project that I was working on actually ending it was ending. So the way it worked at Ubisoft at the time was the fact that when a project would be done, you had to go back to HR and basically submit a resume and they would try to find a position for you within the studio that would fit their needs. And at the time they didn't have any more 3D positions. So um, the HR person basically asked me, have you ever thought of becoming a UI artist? Because she saw that I actually studied in graphic design and I uh, swear to God, I was like, what's UI? I really didn't even know what UI was at the time. And because um, it was really early in the day, um, in early in the years of like UX and UI was not a thing that a lot of people put a lot of thought into it. Oftentimes it was the concept artist that would do the front end menu or the buttons. But um, as the field evolved, it became more 
predominantly more in porn, obviously. So I basically became a UX, uh, UI artist on a PSP game called Rocky Balboa. And I really just really love the craft. And I said to myself, this is really what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I've uh, been doing that for, uh, since then. And I truly, truly enjoy it. So I also worked at uh, many different type of platforms. So I actually, as I mentioned, I worked on the PSP. Um, I even worked on the Game Boy Advance. Uh, I worked on mobile, console. I also worked on PC. Um, in VR, and I also did a stint in uh, augmented reality. Um, I also worked in console, but I also worked in movies and television shows back early when I was living in Montreal. That was like a long time ago. Um, so here, I'd like to share with you guys uh, my demo reel. So that is my uh, demo reel. All right. So, um, so what is UX and UI, right? So a good analogy is the ketchup bottle. Um, so back in the days, we used to have a glass bottle with ketchup, and which was not really functional because we all had the issue of taking the knife and putting into the bottle and try to scrape all that ketchup at the very end or or try to like hit that bottle really hard and then you make a mess. It was not very functional, right? But then Heinz basically a couple of years later basically came up with a more eco-friendly bottle that is made out of plastic, that is squeezable, and then you can basically put um, – the the, the 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 spout is basically at the bottom of the bottle which makes sense right so um so when you have the plastic bottle that's more of the ux because it's more form and function whereas the glass bottle is more ui where in the sense of it's it's very nice it's nice to look at but it's unfortunately not very functional so this is a really good analogy of what ui and ux um is so why am i here well my goal is to inspire some of you to think outside of the box and possibly think of a career into UX and to UI. So what are some of the skill sets that you may need to become a UX and UI designer? Um, for me, I feel like the most, one of the most important um, skill set to be a UX designer is to have empathy. Because uh, having empathy is really important because you need to understand where your player um, is basically coming from. And you oftentimes would have to put yourself into the shoes of whoever is going to be using your interface. So having empathy, understanding where the player is coming from is tremendously important. Then we basically have for UI, we have graphic design. So graphic design is basically is elements like that is all visuals. And um, so if you understand color theory, topography, layout, um, then UI could be something that might be interesting for you. I feel like um, an underutilized skill set oftentimes is motion 
um, because for me, motion is for me is, is really important uh, simply because it's it's a lot more efficient to showcase a, a UI transition using something like After Effects um, because you can basically build a prototype very quickly in After Effects and just showcase that. But also like even when you're using Unreal or Unity, um, you can basically have like your animations into your UI to give that slick kind of slick move and um, really add that pizzazz that you need sometimes into your UI. And also if you're familiar with like 3D, um, 3D like game engines or even like Maya or 3ds Max, like you would actually have to be using a game engine, as I mentioned, like Unity or Unreal. So being familiar with X, Y, and Z uh, would actually add a lot of benefit for you. All right, so what is UX design? So UX is basically is user experience. Um, so the UX in, in video game design is a specific discipline of design that is centered around the psychology of the player and their behaviors, thinking processes and capabilities. UX designers play a crucial role in the video game industry as they act as the bridge between game design and the player. They help game designers define rules, create mechanics, create wireframes, prototypes, onboarding the player, and much more. So some of the skill set again is having empathy, um, accessibility, solving design problems. And for me, you kind of have to be a gamer because a lot of times when we have conversations in a group setting is that we'll be talking about other games like, uh, hey, have you seen this game over here? And we'll try to find like, hey, this is this work, worked really well for this game. Maybe we can work it in our game. So I feel like being a gamer is kind of important to understand like what is relevant in today's industry. And then, so what is UI design? So UI design is in the game dev studios are responsible for designing all the visual elements of the game that allows the player to navigate menus, select options, and interact with game objects. This includes designing interfaces for character creation, inventory management, game settings, and more. The UI designer goal is to create an intuitive and visual appealing interface that is easy to navigate and provides the player with the necessary information and tools to play at the game. So then again, it goes back to being a graphic, graphic design, iconography, and style guide. And here we actually have an example of Dishonored, uh, which basically you can see here that it's very artsy. It has a very nice tone to it. Just looking at this interface, you get, you get the DNA of what the game is about because um, just the visual style, it just looks great. So there's also another component that a lot of people are starting to realize because we have like movies like Marvel, like Iron Man. Um, it's a term that's, you know, it's been around uh, for, for a few years now, but um, FUI is basically stands for fake, fictional, future, fantasy, user interface, right? It's all about what looks really good, like a lot of eye candy, as I mentioned, like Iron Man in the helmet, um, so FUE stands for a fictional user interface. It refers to the use of user interface design in works of fiction, such as films, television shows, and video games. FUE is designed to appear functional and usable within the context of the fictional world, but it's actually not functional in the real life. However, that being said, we do get a lot of inspiration from um, elements that are actually really that are in the real world. So for example, if you were to be making a FUI of a radar screen, you would be looking at real radar screens in the real world and get inspired by this. But it doesn't mean that in the movies or in your FUI, it actually has to be functional. It just has to look really uh, appealing to the people. So again, um, skill set would be motion, 3D, and VFX. Uh, would be important to build some FUEs for that. Okay, so how does it all start, right? Well, it starts with the game design document, what we call a GDD. And a GDD is very collaborative. It's basically, it comes from a lot of different departments. It could be from the game designers, it's from the UX designer. Um, so the game designer features design, onboarding, initial design, and narrative. So it's basically a prepared brief that gives overview of the feature design. UX and the UI designer can begin exploring UX and UI solutions. 
So over here, we basically have a diagram of uh, three of the main components of what entails into what would be considered, in my opinion, a medium-sized studio. Um, so basically, you would have a UX designer, then you would have a UI designer, and then you would also have a UI tech engineer. Um, so the UX designer here, you can actually see that there's like words like FTUE, which stands for first time user experience. So the first time user experience is when somebody actually never played the game and they will go through the process of the onboarding. Um, it's also a great time to ask for accessibility options. So for example, if you're colorblind or um, you know, hearing pair. So, and once you go through that first time user experience, those settings are oftentimes are saved into the player's profile. Um, so they, you don't have to go through that experience every time you load the game. Um, but here we actually have other words like analytics, uh, return on investment, user stories. And then, so in the red here, this is basically all of some words that are relevant to the UX designer. And in the blue here, we basically have UI design. So basically words like visual design, high fidelity mockup, uh, break down the UI assets, topography, patterns, iconography. And over here, we basically in the green, we have the UI tech engineer. So we basically have like visual basic, uh, code, C++, so pretty much all the programming stuff that is part of like Unreal or, um, or Unity. But you can see here that in the midpoint, we have flows and gray boxes. And I'm going to get back to that in the next slide. But my, what, what's really important here is that you can see in the center right here is that we have words like communication design, um, because that's everybody's responsibility, right? It's also the UX designer, the UI designer. But when you're basically building documentation, you basically you want to make sure that that's actually everybody's um, contribution. And so over here, we basically between on the top here, we have the UX design and we have the UI designer. So we have words like persona, research, empathy, creative uh, thinking, onboarding. So these are basically... Um, shared responsibility between the UX and the UI designer. And um, so, yeah, and as I mentioned here, this is everybody's responsibility. Um, and now on the next slide, you will see that there's actually a UX of how we go and do UX. So it all starts with, I, I mentioned the game design, um, game design to GDD documentation. So the game designer will basically give, will write the game des design document right here. They will share this with the leads or the producer, and then they're gonna set the priorities. Are they clear or they're not? If they're clear, then we basically have a kickoff meeting. So in the kickoff meeting, we will have everybody from the art director, the producer, the UX, UI. Um, so everybody's on the same page at that point. And uh, the game designer will basically share their GDD with everybody on the team. And once that is done, basically the UX designer what they're gonna do is that they're gonna review the design document and they're gonna ask, are the tasks clear? Yes. Then what we're gonna do is that we're gonna ge generate a JIRA task. And JIRA is basically a task management that a lot of game dev studios use. Um, and then once the JIRA ticket is done, you actually add the watchers, like the art director, producer, game designer. So everybody on the team basically knows um, what the process, uh, sorry, what is the uh, status of each of those tasks. Um, so basically when you're done with the task at hand, so this could be complete the research, could be the wireframe, could be the prototyping, um, then you basically do user testing because user testing is really, really important um, when conducting um, testing to make sure that your, your UX is efficient. Um, so basically you do your user testing, um, then you basically call into a meeting. Um, if it, there's no meeting, then you basically uh, Get the stakeholder approved. So this would be, I, mean, I mentioned the producer, game designer, art director. And if the stakeholders approve this, then you basically set the JIRA ticket to verify. And then the work is, is done. However, you can see here that there's actually a purple line and it says gray boxes right here. And it goes all the way to the UI engineer. And the reason for that is because the UI engineer basically doesn't need beautiful art. The UI engineer just need to understand what is the flow. So, and the flow could be from point A to point B, uh, but they don't need the art. They just basically, the UI engineer can go into starting building the blueprint logic um, into Unreal or in Unity, 
and start basically be building all the code that is behind the UX by having a prototype because then they would understand what the flow is. So, and here we basically in the blue, we have the visual artist, they review the UX. So basically the prototype that the UX has given to the UI artist, and then it's kind of the same flow. Uh, they will generate a JIRA ticket uh, at the watchers. They will complete the mockups as requested, get the approval from the art director um, if needed to. And then they also, once they're done with the mockup, it's really important to actually build a style guide. So the style, the style guide will basically have all of the elements of the UI and you want to make sure that you have all the different states. For example, if you have buns, you have to make sure that the default, the press, hover, disable, locked, all of those um, buttons will have to be displayed into the style guide itself. And then you basically generate the art for the for Unreal. And so basically breaking down all of the art into Unreal, breaking down into a certain way. And then you basically reskin the UMG or blueprint. So a lot of times what's going to happen is that the UI engineer would actually use gray boxes. And with the gray boxes, as I mentioned, they don't really need to have beautiful art. But what happens is that once the UI artist goes into Unreal, then they basically can take the gray boxes and they can reskin it um, to their liking. And basically, when that is done, um, then you basically test this into the editor. And once this is tested, uh, then you set your status to verify. So, and then over here on the side, we basically have QA. Uh, so, if you have anything that is UX, UI, or UI tech engineer, review bugs or tasks and you basically go through the Jira ticket um, once more. So let's talk a little bit deeper into UX versus UI. So UX designers tend to focus on creating a product that solves a problem, while UI designers work on designing patterns and micro details of the product. UX designers think extensively about how to make a product easy to use, while UI designers think extensively how about to make a product delightful and enjoyable to use, right? UX is what the user experience, while UI is what we see while using a product. So one thing that's really important, um, and this is one of my, um, my, my motto in life, is that I always take functionality over aesthetic. Um, you know, you can have the most beautiful UI, but if it's not functional, or the player is lost and they're frustrated and they're having a really bad user experience, then you have failed. Um, you know, so it's really important that, you know, maybe aesthetically it's not as pleasing, but having form and function as a UX designer is way more important um, because you want to make sure that people are happy using your, your product or your game and they know what they're doing because they get that, that sense of accomplishment and they know what they're, they're familiar with. So UX designers, as I mentioned, they're good for defining problem, understanding the users, creating personas, generating tasks and user flows, um, onboarding. Um, onboarding is really important as well because for me personally, it's either can make break, it can make or break a game. Um, and onboarding is basically is how you teach the player to play your game. And depending on what type of platform you are, if you're like, for example, on console or on mobile, there are certain ways to basically make sure that the player is feels very at ease on being onboarded, that they're not feeling pressured. Um, so there are tactics of how basically um, onboard the player. Um, creating sketches, wireframes, and prototype. And then also being doing usability testing, and of course, accessibility. Then we have the UI designer. So the UI designer is the visual artist, uh, does topography, color scheme, iconography, grids and layouts, and then they do the style guide. And as I mentioned, buttons, inputs, and form. So let's talk about UX and gameplay. So designer struggles with the player freedom in games, right? So like a lot of games will, for like example, like uh, we have here Lara Croft and we have God of War. So basically the player can go pretty much anywhere in the world. 
Um, but there are things that in the environment that actually entice the player to go there and get, grab their attention. So, for example, in Laura Croft, when you're basically climbing the walls, there will be some markings on the walls. And um, so they just the players will understand that, oh, that's a, actually a section that I climbed the wall. So over here I say players have an agency, meaning they can do whatever they want. Many levels are linear with sequence of problems, enemies, and bosses. Games and levels are growing larger, leading to confusion for players into the environment they play in. So visual cues could be, as I mentioned, painted walls in Tomb Raider, ropes and colored ledges in Uncharted, rock painting in Horizon Zero Dawn, or runic paint in God of War. These are some of the examples that some games are using to basically give that visual language to the player and for them to understand that, hey, if I go there, then I will probably um, moving forward into the level. Another important factor to keep in mind when we're actually building UX and UI is understanding the medium or the peripheral that the user is actually going to be using. So for example, um, how you approach um, a game that is on the PC on a keyboard and mouse will be dramatically different than if you were to be doing something in VR, where in VR you basically would be something that could be laser or tactile. And then we also have consoles. The console is more limiting because you basically have a controller. So you have the cursor, or you could have the D-pad and the joystick. And then we have mobile, which is basically touch and haptics. So, um, so basically, how you build your UX, you have to be mindful of what is the way that people are going to be using um, the medium itself. So I'm going to be talking about some of the tools that I usually use. Um, so tools to basically that, uh, that I use is uh, Miro or Mural. Um, these are great tools for basically building mind maps and flows. And here's actually an example of a flow chart that I've done. This was actually for a project, a personal project of mine that call, that's called Battle Rigs. And you can see here that from Battle Rigs, I have the main menu page right here. And then the main menu page basically breaks out into different sections. So we have like play, we have training, um, we have the, the roster, the loot box, options, and inside of options, you, there's another branch. So this is really good to build your map when you're basically building your game. Um, because understanding where you're going when you're building your UX is really, really important. So this is basically is like your roadmap. And um, so tools like Miro or Mural are great for just doing these mind maps and understanding what the flow is for the player's journey. So, and then we basically get into tools for building prototypes. Um, so a lot of people, UX designers, will use either Figma or Adobe XD, um, which they're both owned by Adobe now. And um, so, yeah, it's just a preference. Um, and uh, personally, I use Adobe XD because I'm more into the um, Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, and I'll show you some tips later down in this presentation um, how I use Adobe XD and Illustrator and Photoshop as well. So here's like an example of uh, my prototype uh, in Adobe XD of this game that I call Battle Rig. Um, so over here, you can actually see that I have a PS5 controller in my hand right here. And this is actually a prototype. And when I'm actually clicking on this, you can see how immersive this, um, this demo is. So I can actually go through this. And um, so for example, if I want to click on options, I can click on option and I can go to audio, chat, video. And then, so it kind of feels like a real game. And I can actually go, if I were to go into like play, for example, um, I can select a role, uh, tank, and you can hear here that I have a carousel and I can actually select the player that I would want. So for example, if I were to select uh, Jason right here, and then over here, I would have like a power up and I would select any of the power up and I can go left or right. Um, so, and if I select this uh, power up and then now I would select the ability. So if I were to select any of these abilities, so, and then there you go. And then I would have um, the launch 
of uh, of the game, and I would hit square, and that would be launching into the game at that point. So, um, so yeah, so having a prototype is actually really good, and I can actually share this prototype with other people on my team and collect their user feedback, see what works, what doesn't work, and then go back and just see um, what I can improve upon. So other tools, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of Adobe. Um, so I do use Illustrator, Photoshop, and After Effects. Um, so Illustrator for me, I use it to basically build a lot of my shapes. Um, and then basically when I do my shapes in Illustrator, I basically export them into Photoshop. And then I'll use Photoshop to build all of my visual um, components. Like So for example, if I were to do like buns, I will basically create all my buns using layer styles into Photoshop. And then also if I were to need to have a need of an animation. So for example, if I need like a blinking light or if I want to do a menu transition from point A to point B, I would actually build it into After Effects because building a menu transition into the game engine would actually be really cumbersome. Um, and it would actually take a lot of time because not only would I have to break down all of my art assets into Unreal or Unity, um, but then chances are is that I would actually would need a UI engineer to help me out um, to build all of my menu transition. So when I'm using After Effects, I can probably build my animation within a day or two, depending on how complex it is. So it's just a better way, efficient way of building, um, of working basically into uh, using motion graphics to help to tell the team, how do you expect the, the menu transition from point A to point B? So, and here's like a high fidelity mock-up. So we saw like the, the my prototype that I shared with you guys in Adobe XD. And this is basically how I would expect it to see into the game. Um, so obviously here, there's a lot more colors, um, but you can see here on the right-hand side that these are all my layer styles um, into Photoshop. And um, I like to work in layer styles because it's a non-destructive way of building something into Photoshop. Um, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go into more of a deep dive into later on in this presentation, how I go about doing that. But you can see that all of my layers here, they're basically all shape layers. And there's a reason for that. Because with shapes, you can actually scale down or uh, scale up or scale down your shapes without losing any of your resolution. So it's a great way to work in a non-destructive way. So um, game studios. So not all game studios will have a dedicated UX or uh, motion designer. So most game studios are looking for a hybrid of UX and UI designers. That being said, major studios like 150 people will most likely have dedicated resources for UX and UI designers. So when I think of like studios like um, Ubisoft or Bungie, which you know they have way more than 150 people working at that studio, they will have more resources into the UX and UI department, you know. But oftentimes, uh, the medium-sized gaming studio, um, it's been my experience where a lot of times is that people are looking for a hybrid of a UX and UI designer. Um, so, so yeah. All right, so now let's talk about accessibility. So accessibility is a very hot topic. Um, and um, so, but what is accessibility? So uh, why accessibility? To expand the audience and accessibility by catering to individuals with uh, disability, including those who are colorblind, hearing impaired, have limited vision or other limitations. This also has an impact on individuals themselves Disabilities can be categorized into three different types, permanent, temporarily, and situational. So temporarily disabilities, such as a broken arm or leg, are typically short-lived. In contrast, permanent, permanent disabilities, such as blindness or deafness, have a lifelong impact. Situ uh, situational disability affects a person's ability to see, hear, or focus, depending on their environment, right? So as I mentioned, there's different ways you can be disabled, um, but uh, accessibility is, is really, really important because you want basically more players to play your game. And if you don't cater to those people in mind, 
then you have failed because not everybody can play your game. So how to consider accessibility. So accessibility should be considered from the very beginning. If we start with the empathetic approach for all the potential players, we would create a much stronger and meaningful experience and more diverse community. Center your user experience design around from the beginning and an ongoing basis afterwards. Creating different types of personas with limitations helps maintain an exclusive approach throughout the design process. A persona is a hypothetical participant in your experience with specific motivation, desires, and traits typically based on research and interviews with real people. All right. And also, accessibility matters. So it's our audience. So according to the United States 2012 census, 56.7 million Americans, so that would be about 19% of the U.S. population, have some sort of disability. And out of this number, an estimated 38.3 million, 12.6, have a severe disability. And also, when you cater to accessibility, it empowers the players. So players will feel independent, confident, creative, tailoring accessibility features to their individual needs. And then you also create inclusiveness, realizing the needs of people with disabilities. A new world opens up, accessibility becomes a mindset. So when everyone can play, we all win. That's really important to think about when um, you have to be mindful of, like as I mentioned, of people that might not be as lucky as you that, you know, if you're healthy and you have, you know, you basically have to make sure that you cater to some of the people that, you know, they might get motion sickness when they're playing a VR game, for example. You know, you have to be mindful of that. Or as I mentioned, like colorblind, or they might be missing a limb. So features like control remapping for buttons is really important for them. So having those options in the game uh, could either you know, let some players play the game or not, unfortunately. So here are some different types of accessibility. So one is motor. So motor would be control, mobility, motion sensitivity. So provides controller custom configuration and remapping, as I mentioned. Provide options to adjust or toggle haptic feedback. Provide distance interactions options. Avoid sickness triggers like strobing, flickering, or motion blur. Provide options to switch between standing versus seating play. Then we have cognitive. So cognitive would be thought, memory, process information. So provide a range of game difficulty, uh, get, uh, game difficulty levels. So for example, I'm the type of gamer that I will always play on easy mode. It's not because, um, I don't want the challenge is because for me, I don't have the time to spend 30, 40 hours on one particular game. Um, so I try to make it as easy as possible. Uh, so providing those kind of options is actually really good um, because some people, you know, they need that because for them, maybe uh, the hard setting would be way too difficult or the puzzles might be too difficult difficult for them to basically bypass in the game and they might give up, which would not be a good feeling for, um, for the gamer. Provide clear HUD notification. Provide haptic cues to reinforce game interactions. Use simple, clear language for text. Then we have visual. So visual will be legibility, readability, cognitive. Provide subtitles customization. Provide colorblind presets. Provide high contrast settings. Choose a default font that is easy readable with a strong legibility, height, width, and thickness. Then we have audio. So audio will be cognitive spatial awareness. Provide subtitles for all important speech. Provide separate volume controls for sound effects, speech, and background uh, music. Provide spatial audio. Include closed captioning for sound effects. Avoid, avoid conveying essential game information by sound alone. So for example, if you're playing a game and the telephone rings in the game and you know the person is deaf, um, they're not gonna hear the telephone ringing and that could be like a part of the gameplay. 
So what you would probably would have to do is either have like a subtitle that says ring, ring. Um, so they actually understand that, oh, there's a telephone or, or even make the telephone vibrate or something that there's a visual cue that the player actually understand that, hey, there's something going on here, but you're not just relying on the audio to message that information to the player. Then we also have speech. So cognitive spatial awareness. So provide subtitles for all important speech. Provide separation, uh, separate volume controls for sound effects, speech, background, and music. Provide spatial audio. Include closed captioning for sound effects. Avoid conveying essential game information by sound alone. I should never have the to be reminded of my speech difficulties when my game console cannot understand my voice. All right. There's also a website that's called Game Accessibility Guidelines, which is right here. Um, and this basically this website highlights a lot of what I just mentioned. So for those who are actually interested of learning more about accessibility, the website is called gameaccessibilityguidelines.com. All right, so another uh, thing to keep in mind is colorblind. So, um, so depending on which type of colorblind, we can use shapes, letters, and patterns to differentiate the elements. So here's an example of, of um, we have like all these colors on the left-hand side. We have red, yellow, and blue. And then, um, so, but for some people, they might not be able to differentiate those colors. So what you can do is basically is use shapes, patterns. You can see here in the red, there's actually a pattern in there. Um, you can use a different shape. Um, and so that would actually help a lot of people that could be colorblind understanding what is um, the shape or the visual cue that they, they would need. Also, some accessibility settings could be um, user customization settings. So contrast, brightness, saturation. So control over how things will look uh, to the players, whereas only having customization would put the responsibility entirely on the player. Settings that the user should be able to customize are contrast, brightness, and saturation. So oftentimes, these options are actually provided to the player at the very beginning of the game. And that would be considered like part of the FTUE, as I mentioned. Um, but this is actually helps helps out the player um, to to play the game. So um, yeah. So as I mentioned, maximizing the impact of subtitle. So uh, so here we have The Last of Us, and you can see here that there's actually a little pointer that basically tells the direction of where the audio is coming from. So. Um, highlight word, uh, word for puzzle, use a color that is isn't affected by color blindness and add an extra indicator with a shader, font style, or texture. Uh, subs, important for non-native speaker, multiple language trans, uh, translation effect, effective for wider players engagement and business success. So now I'm gonna switch gear here and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to prep art assets for any game engine. So you can see here that on my left-hand side, I have an Illustrator file, and I'm just gonna open up Illustrator right now. And you can see this is my shape right here. So this is basically, I created this in Illustrator, and you can see that everything is done is that when I go into Photoshop, I copy these, and then I would go into Photoshop. I just took a minute there. All right. I was afraid it would crash. My apologies. All right. So you can see here that um, this button, for example, all of the done in Illustrator, all the shapes. And when I would paste them into, um, into Photoshop, um, so this, I would always select shape layers. It's really important to select shape layers because shape layers allows you to use add layer styles. And um, so you can see here that element right here are basically all, these are all shapes. So you can see that on all of these. So let me expand these. So all of these are layer styles, and you can see as I'm putting all these together, all of this is right. Now, another thing too to mention 
here is that we want to make sure that we name our layers accordingly. So here I would say uh, T underscore bun default. So the default would be the state of the button itself. So this would be default. And what I would do is that I would just go ahead and click and drag like this, and then I would actually duplicate this and rename it. I'm gonna, I've already done it, but it would be hover. And the way that I would do is that I would just go into the hover and um, I would do that. Sorry, I would go into um, into the layers, and then I would start making the changes. So for example, here it says that you know I have an orange. And I would actually select the color orange. I would make all the modifications that I would want. And then over here, I would have to do the same thing for the press. So I would have the default hover and press. As I mentioned, so basically when I'm building my assets, I use everything from Illustrator. Then I export, I, I put everything into my shape layers, into Photoshop, and I use layer styles to basically build all of my assets. And this is a way that I work in a non-destructive way uh, because it's easy to basically make some modifications. Um, and uh, so once I'm done with all of this, uh, so you can see here that I have a PSD file, uh, and then inside of that, I have all of my, um, my assets. So what I would do here is that I would actually go ahead and duplicate this, then rename this PNG, and then I'm going to delete this guy, and then I'm going to hide the layer. And then I would just hit Control E to merge those layers. And then I would do this the same here, Control E. Go here, Control E. And now I have all of my assets and actually can go and export them and put them into Unreal. So it's a really smart way to work in a non-destructive way. Um, and the, the other thing too is that let's just say like three months down the road you're in production and then your art director says, hey, Stefan, can you change the color of the hover instead of orange, can you make it yellow or green or, or another color? What I would do then is that I would open up my this file and I would go into my PSD folder and then whatever the change the art director would request, I would just go ahead and do like let's say if I would want green for example, I can make this green and even like the, the glow, I can make the glow green. Um, you know, so let me go here and then select like the green for example, and then. What I can do is I can copy this, copy the layer style, and all I would have to do is select all this one here, paste it, uh, paste layer style, and then there you go. I think this would be a different one, but um, you get the point. So basically, copying layer styles is really easy. You can manipulate them from one layer to another, um, so which is which is really great. All right. So as I mentioned, um, you can move your layer styles. Oh, and here's. Here's a tip, a uh, nice little trick I want to show you guys as well. So, for example, let me go over here. So, I'm going to the default. So, for example, if I were to click on this guy right here, the drop shadow, um, I can actually go into the canvas. And if you can see that, if I can actually manipulate the drop shadow where I want it just by clicking on this, I can also do the same thing with the pattern overlay. So, for example, if I want to move the pattern, I can actually just move it. Instead of like using these um, widgets right here, um, you know, the scale, for example, you can actually move it from there. Um, so this is pretty cool. And the, the other thing, too, is that if I just want to like uh, duplicate, like for example, I'm going to remove the drop shadow on this layer right here. And let's just say if I want to select this drop shadow and put it on this layer, all I would have to do is click on the drop shadow right here and press Alt on my keyboard. And then you can see that I actually can move the drop shadow. And then, boom, the drop shadow is now on that layer. So, um, so those are some tips and tricks when using layer styles and uh, to work more efficiently. Oh, and another important factor is to make sure that you always have a gray, white, black background. Um, so you can see here in my Photoshop file, I always have a BG uh, folder. And inside of that, I have, like I mentioned, the gray, white, black background. And the reason for that is because you want to make sure that if you have any transparency or alpha, uh, you want to make sure you can actually see it. Because in a game, you really never know what your UI is going to look like if it's um, on top of a, um, of a level or a different screen of some sort. So it's really important to make sure that you can actually see all of your elements very clearly, and no matter if it's on black, white, or uh, gray. So for example, um, if you were to build a reticle, uh, a reticle is basically a um, when you have a gun, for example, and you'll have like a little dot. If your dot of the reticle is pure white, and you would be on a level that is basically a snowstorm, or you're looking at, uh, or, or when you're looking at the sky, if you put white on white, um, then your reticle would actually be um, not visible, and that would frustrate the player. So it's really important that you have the gray, the black, and the white for those reasons um, there. 
Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I guess when I had Photoshop, the audio is not very clear, so it's causing some issues. Okay, so um, the black, gray, white background. So uh, as I mentioned, it's for legibility. Uh, the white reticle on a snow snowstorm level, for example. Transparency, foreground and background. Never assume the background color of your buttons. So now let's talk about AI and how that, uh, that you can actually use AI to help you. So for example, using ChatGPT, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of ChatGPT. Um, ChatGPT is also really good to replace uh, placeholder text into your UI layout. So back in the day, we used to use Lorem Ispam, um, which is basically just like Latin faux text. And now um, we can actually use ChatGPT to generate um, to generate basically dummy text a part of your layout. And the great thing also with ChatGPT, you can actually use it to build personas. Um, so, for example, here you can see that I've used uh, ChatGPT. So I said to ChatGPT, "You are a senior UX designer for a blockchain game. I'd like to please, I like." Excuse me. I'd like you to please generate five different personas using a table for a game that is adventurous and action-packed. Please be detailed. And then it basically generated five different type of personas into a table format, which is really, really great. Um, yeah, this is amazing. When I when I realized I could do that, um, that was a game changer for me. And then, um, you know, I'm sure a, a lot of you have heard about Midjourney. Um, so Midjourney is great for uh, ideas of layout, uh, concept, mood board, um, and also like visual style. So for example, here, I was just kind of playing around with like having possibly like a, a Spider-Man kind of like um, front end menu and how it could be, you know, getting some inspiration from that. And then on the right hand side, I was just playing around with some icons and see how I can actually um, have some icons ideas for, for a game. But, and this could be something that could be used for mobile or something like that. So um, so yeah, so Chad, uh, I mean, Mid Journey is, is pretty awesome to get some really good ideas of, um, for, your game, um, for your game layout. You can also build in Mid Journey some personas. So for example, once I've done my personas in ChatGPT, I basically had to create all these layouts. And um, so I basically went on mid journey and I said, hey, generate me some personas, um, ideas. And it basically generated these ideas for me. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is something I can really use. And um, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. So let's do a bit of a recap here. Um, so, Throughout the presentation, we discussed the different roles that compose of a UX and UI team, explain the various contribution that each role makes to the team. We review the tools that uh, UX and UI designer uses. We highlighted the importance of different types of accessibility options. We demonstrated how to produce non-destructive and adaptable art assets for any game engine using layer styles. Discuss how AI can speed up the design process and assist us with placeholder text and generating quick mockups for ideas. So why would you consider a career into UX and UI? Well, simply because it's in demand and it's constantly evolving. Um, I feel like, especially now that we're in the birth of AI, a lot of things are going to be changing into UX and UI, but I, it's it's... I would say it's an ever constantly changing type of job. Like how the UI artist that I was like five or 10 years ago is dramatically different than who I am today. So for me, I totally embrace this. I think it's very challenging. Games are getting so much more complex nowadays as well. Um, and then we have features like accessibility and um, onboarding and so, 15 years ago, we didn't really think of that. And now games are really more detailed um, and it's more challenging than ever to build good UX uh, for a game. So it has a lot of good challenges and it's a lot of fun to be in. It's a great field. 
So where to start? There are some websites out there like gameuidatabases.com and interfaceingame.com. These websites actually do highlight some of these. Uh, so for example, um, Game UI Database will actually have a lot of different UIs of games. Um, so for example, if I would click here, so you can actually see all of the UI. Um, these are really nice tools to have because when I'm looking for inspiration or, for, or if I'm looking for a game UX or UI that I may have not played, I will go to those websites and try to do my research and see if I can find anything that would actually help me produce my game. And also, uh, for those who might be interested, I have generated a font um, that is basically the PS4 and Xbox. So everything that is uppercase is basically is the PS4 button, and whatever is the lowercase is Xbox. And I'm hoping this will not cause audio issue, but I'm going to open up Adobe XD, and I'm going to show you guys um, how you can actually um, use this. Um, so you can see here, James, you let me know if this causes any audio issues, please, okay? Um, so you can see here that I have two screens. And uh, I've actually used my font right here. Try to go like this. Yeah, I'm trying like. So you can see here that I'm going from eight, but this is basically how you, you would create this. Uh, you can download um, this, uh, this font if you go to stefandubay.com and at the very bottom right here, you can actually download my font um, and it's free to charge. So, um, so yeah. All right, and then there's also, um, so some of you may know, but I actually have a Facebook group called UI Peeps. Um, so feel free to just go on, on Facebook, type in UI Peeps, and you will find my group. And also there's a Discord channel um, that is basically is for UI Peeps. Um, there's the link for those who would be interested. And then that's it. That's it for my presentation. Here's all my information. I'm terribly sorry for all the audio issues. We weren't for this. So, um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's really odd. <laughs> something, something to do with Adobe just doesn't, doesn't like it. Um, yeah. But it was, it was audible enough. Um, you, you could make it out. It just was a little bit garbled. So, yeah, yeah thanks so much. This is a great insight into your process, Stefan. No um, so let's get started with some questions uh, from the chat. Um, the first one up was, um, is it necessary to go through other jobs? As you mentioned, you said you started in, in a different kind of um, place before you, you jumped into UI. Um, and maybe that sort of answers the question in and of itself. But um, maybe you can uh, talk further about that. Do you think it's important to start in another place or you can just jump right into UI UX as a designer? I think that in today's um, today's world, you know, back when I first started, I could not go to a school and be like, hey, I want to learn UX and UI design. That was unfortunately not an option for me. And um, but now there are a lot of schools that do offer um, UX and UI, even like there's a lot of boot camps. Um, so I would say that you can even find a lot of YouTube videos. And, um, and if you go to UI peeps on my Facebook group, there could be some classes on there that you can also uh, look up because I do promote a class in particular. Um, and that would be actually be a, a good fit. Um, so there's just like a lot of options nowadays. And I feel like back in the days, um, those options were not there for us, but I would say that you, um, you can definitely get into UX um, because there's, like as I mentioned, there are some schools that do offer a, a schooling for that discipline by itself. Um, and then as for UI, yeah, I think there's just, there's a lot of schools out there and or YouTube videos that you can learn and how to get into the field is really, is, is it's your portfolio. 
um, that's how you're going to get the job. So basically, you just have to make sure that um, you know you have. A, a strong portfolio and it's on point and you're basically showcasing what you really want to do. So if you want to do UX, then you basically have to make sure that you have like case studies, you have really good example of what your UX is all about, what, you know, and same thing with the UI. So if you're more into the artistic side of things, then just basically build your, a, a strong portfolio that is UI re related. Awesome. All right. Great. Um... Another question from the chat. Um, are there any um, U good UX books that you would recommend? Um, or I guess I guess any UX related books that, that you would recommend? Definitely. So I would say anything that is Celia Hodent. Um, so if you give me two seconds, I actually have, um, I pretty much have all her books. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, These are some of the books that I've actually have. This is uh, the the Gamer's Brain by Celia Hoden, and Celia also has a website. Uh, so if you just type type in like uh, Google her name, uh, mm -hmm. she has a website. Um, but she has a lot of good. Um, for me, she's probably one of the best uh, UX designers out there. She also wrote this book right here. And then um, there's also this book, The Game um, Usability, as well. Um, these are really good books. I've uh, I've read them all. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Um, the next question is, uh, have you ever used prototyping tools over XD Figma? So I've never used Figma, uh, personally, just because I got into Adobe XD. Um, and what I like about Adobe XD is the fact that I'll just be, you know, I can go from Illustrator, Photoshop, and then go back to XD if I wanted to. Um, but I know a lot of people do prefer Figma over XD. It's just a personal choice. Um, you know, I know that there are things that Figma does and they, it does very well. Um, again, it's just a preference. It's like, why would you use Maya over 3ds Max? You know, it's, it's kind of like kind of the same same analogy, I guess you could say. Awesome. Um, but um, but yeah, I'm just uh, I like to stay in the ecosystem of um, of Adobe. But again, it's just a personal choice. Great, yeah. Um, and I know this kind of jump jumps circles back to our first question. But um, uh, any tips for getting your first job? Um, one of the things that I always like to throw into that is like you know, obviously said it's all about the portfolio. Um, but do, are there any things that you would recommend as far as maybe good exercises for students to have in their portfolio, um, good things to show and demonstrate that you're you're capable of doing? I would say the most important thing would be to show the processes of things. So basically, you know, every you know, obviously, like having that eye candy of beautiful portfolio piece is great. But understanding where you, how you got there, showing that process of like, oh, well, I did my research, I did my UX, I did my layout, I did my wireframe, I did a prototype, I did user testing, here's the feedback. All of that, that process is really, really important. And you don't really necessarily have to showcase that into your portfolio. Um, but that being said, it's something that during an interview process, you could definitely show to the hiring manager that, hey, here's my process and here's like how I got from point A to point B. So that's something that I would definitely highlight for sure. Great. That's good. Some great advice. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Um, another question. Uh, what would be your advice uh, for a job hunter that has been getting some rejections looking for a UI? Uh, Keep working on that portfolio, man. Um, rejection should be a motivation to push you even harder. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So I would definitely just keep at it. Also, always ask recruiters what is the feedback. Why did you not? have get the job is it because there's some there's something missing in your portfolio if there was something missing then you, you want to find out because then you want to basically 
uh, you want to fix it right moving forward. So, yeah, that's that's a good that's a good call. Uh, it's one of the things I always tell my students. You know, if you can get feedback um, and you're lucky enough to have have a um, a job uh, g g uh, interview give you some feedback, always ask for it. It's a yeah, great, exactly. Great, great resource. Don't be afraid of that. Yeah. Um, and then and just to add one more thing too, is like also like reach out to the community. Like for mm -hmm. example, like uh, on my uh, Facebook group, for example, you know, you can actually post your um, your progress and ask for feedback. Ask feedback from other peers, uh, like other professional people want to help you out. They really, you know. So just keep at it, keep working on it. So um, because yeah. I got so much rejection. Like it's, it's, it's so hard and never give up. You really got to do this for the love, not just because it's a job, but you really have to love it because as we all know, um, the industry, the video game industry is very volatile. We're constantly um, getting hit by layoffs and, and the thing, the tool that's going to lend you the job is at the end of the day is your portfolio. So never get comfortable as where you're at, where you're at as well. So totally. All right. Um, another question from the chat. Um, can you describe an app or game that meets your ideal UI UX design? What are some of your favorite UI UX designs out there? <laughs> so, um, so my favorite, I, I, I do love the division two. I have to admit um, the division two simply because uh, I love the aesthetics, but also I love the fact that it's a grid. Everything's on the grid mm -hmm. and um, the layout and um, it's really, really cool. I also, the other game, um, Dead Space. Um, uh -huh. So Dead Space is amazing. I actually also love how they did from, De well, I'm not talking about the remake, but I'm talking about the good old Dead Space, how the <laughs> evolution of the UI so, for example, in Dead Space 1, when you would press R3 on the controller, Isaac would have, from his hand, he would have this linear path, and you would mm. know where to go. And yeah. in Dead Space 2, and they, they did the same thing, but instead of being linear, they basically had it so it's Bezier. So mm. it was not as rigid. It was more like a curvature. Um, and I thought that was actually genius, you know? Yeah. Um, so I love looking at the evolution of the UX and the UI of every game. But um, those are some of the games that I really do enjoy, the UX and UI in those yeah, games. Yeah, it's really groundbreaking. The integrated UI stuff in that game is, is really amazing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, another question. Um, have you used uh, chat G GPT to generate text in other languages to test against designs for your localization? No, I haven't. No, for me, chat GPT is too early. Um, however, I have used uh, chat GPT to, because uh, I'm French Canadian. So I do translate a lot of my text sometimes when I'm speaking to family, personal use, you know, like speaking <laughs> to family or something like that. Because uh, yeah. my French now is horrid. It's like I can't. <laughs> it's so bad after living in the states for over like what fifteen years now. I just sure. you know. So, um, but I do use the translation tool um, to translate from English to French, and it's been pretty nice. It does a solid yeah. job. Maybe maybe it's an interesting idea uh, for localization stuff. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Um, next up. Uh, what is your mindset when you're tackling a design to accommodate for other languages? Another localization question. So a rule of thumb that I have is basically is that I always leave about, like if I were to create a button or like a header of some sort, mm -hmm. the rule of thumb is that I always use 20% of dead space um, around the text. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all know that um, a button that says, except for example, in French or German, that word could be way longer. Um, yeah. So compensating with that 20% of dead space at times could compensate and, you know, I can make it fit. Then if not, then there's just like a lot of trial and error at the, you know, you kind of, then you just log it as a bug and you either have to modify the art asset to compensate for the word. And um, that, that's, uh, that's troubling at times, but. It's part of the it's part of the, the job, you know. 
Yeah, you don't think about it, but words can be very different sizes depending on the language, and it's and it and fitting all that thing, all those things in is is a is a big part of making it uh, feel good on the screen. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Another question: Is After Effects popular in game studios to show motion in UI design? Do they prefer prototypes or both? So I would say de depending on both, right? So, but it depends on what uh, at what level you're you're at. So mm -hmm. you're basically like prototyping, like wireframing and prototyping. That I would say is at the early stages of game production, right? So. Um, where I basically use After Effects is it would be for me to um, to showcase like a like a simple menu transition, for example, you know, um, or if I want to um, animate like an effect, like uh, you know, like three, two, one, battle, you know, and if I want to animate that, then I would do that in After Effects, and then I would show it to the team, and I'd be like, hey, what do you guys think about this? And then I would collect the feedback. And then if the feedback is good, then I would actually go into um, in, into Unreal and do this same animation. Um, but that being said, I will is that motion graphic is a very underutilized skill set for UI artists, and that is something that I do encourage people to get more into because once you get into motion, it opens a lot more doors, and it's just a way to work more efficiently. Um, it basically works smarter, not harder. Right. And and maybe just use the, the tool you're most fluent with to get your ideas out kind of. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. And that being said, um, I would say like for me, I'm self-taught um, After Effects and videocopilot.net is a great website to learn um, motion graphics and um, and it's all free. And I've learned a great deal from Andrew Kramer um, from Video Copilot. So, so cool. that, that's good. All right. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, next up, um, would studying Lisp programming language be helpful to or, or valuable in the game in industry? I'm not. I'm not familiar. But are you familiar with that? Lisp? No, no. Lisp. I'm not very familiar with that. All right. So. Um, just looking looking through the chat. Um, uh, any other advice? Maybe a good a good question to uh, wrap with. Any other advice on how to become better at UI, UX, and research, um, useful resources that you, you can recommend. I know you mentioned the Facebook group, which I think is a, is a great place to start, especially, you know, the um, your advice about getting feedback from people, you know, finding a community like that is is huge, right? Yeah. Um, any other? other uh, Don't, you know, knock on people's door, you know, just be polite and just ask for help. And be modest and be humble. Um, you know, no one's ever going to, you know, when, every time that I have somebody who's interested of something, like I will always give them time of day as long as, you know, they understand I could sometimes be busy or something like that. But um, you really have to have passion. I think like you have to have that thrive and that passion because um, that's going to show in your portfolio. Um, some people, you know, they just get, Hum, they just get content and they'll be like, well, I did, you know, I did the homework or I, I did, I, this is my portfolio. Never settle. Just always, always, always push yourself. And those rejection letters, that should lit a fire under your ass and it should just give you more motivation. And look at other people's work. Look, there's like so many great uh, UX, UI designers. Like there's uh, Davidson, there's uh, Jeff Christie, all these people, they're amazing at what they do. And look at their portfolio. Go on ArtStation. Go on Interface and, and Game and those websites. Look for inspiration. Look, you know, um, study it. Also, like, when you're playing a game, like, study the onboarding. Like, pay attention to every detail of, like, oh, how is the game teaching me how to play the game? Like, we take it for granted. But when you actually take a step back and you're kind of just like looking at it, like pay attention to those points. And then, um, you know, you'll get the grasp of it. And then, but again, portfolio, portfolio, portfolio. Yeah. It, but inspiration is really important too. Yeah. Obviously you got to put it in practice, but inspiration is really, is really yeah. important. As well. And also but, like, 
using mid journey stuff like that is, is also great because it can inspire you as well so totally well thank you so much for spending your time here with, with us this evening and and uh all your advice and and information as far as your process and um uh we're, we're gonna wrap now um and thanks everybody for joining us on the stream and um thanks also to our sponsors uh lenovo and nvidia and uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna call call it out now. So uh, everybody in the chat, uh, I know we can't really do a round of applause, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure everybody's saying thanks. And um, and we'll just sign out. Thank you so much, Stefan. All right, thank you guys. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good one. Have a good night. See ya. See ya.